Well, we had been selected, and uh, most of us, in fact, I think all of us, had not seen an actual missile launch. And so they were going to take us down. Here's a brand new bunch of astronauts, and we're going to go down. This is supposed to be a big confidence builder to let us see a big booster take off. So we go down, and they we're on a camera pad not too far from the uh, where the actual launch site was. And it's a beautiful, clear, starry night down there. It's going to be a night launch. And uh, there we were, and the thing lit off as an atlas, I think, was what we were, we were watching. And uh, the thing that we were supposed to eventually ride. And uh, so this thing lights off, and it's a beautiful night. And all you know, it's so theatrical anyway. Just the nature of it looks like it was staged by Hollywood or by Disney or somebody, you know, with the searchlights. And it's, it's uh, quite impressive. It's not designed that way. It just happened that way. And so this thing lights off, and the, the uh, hold down bars pull back, and, and uh, the thing starts up. And where it had had trouble before was going through what we call the high Q point, which is the highest aerodynamic force. It's getting up to high speed, but it didn't have the atmosphere yet. So you build up very high pressure on the front end of this thing, drag. And uh, so that's the high Q point occurs about 30, 35,000 feet right along in that area. And uh, it, we're watching the thing go, and up it goes, and we're watching it hit, a high Q, hit the high Q point up there. And instead of going on through it like it was supposed to, it blew. And it looked, and it looked like an atomic bomb went off right over us. So we all look at each other, you know, and that's the thing we're supposed to ride, you know. So we had a few discussions with the engineers after that. Well, on any flight like that, you're not afraid. Are you apprehensive? Yes. Are you fearful to the point where it interferes with what you're doing? No, you're not. And if you get to that point, you shouldn't be up there to begin with. But we had gone through a lot of the testing of the booster. We had followed that. We'd followed the, the uh, spacecraft development, the Mercury development. And so we had a great deal more experience in this and had a lot more confidence in the equipment uh, than people who had not been through that kind of thing. Space flight was such a new concept. You know, you can't relate to this. You can. You can you can you can uh, imagine yourself driving an Indy dry, an Indianapolis race because you've driven an automobile. Now, granted, the the Indy racers are going faster, but you know what it's like to have a steering wheel and you watch the pictures, and so you sort of Walter Mitty yourself into this. You can sort of uh, almost pseudo experience the thing yourself. We didn't have any experience like that in space flight, and it was so new to most people that they thought, you know, this was either so new we shouldn't be doing it, or we were crazy to be trying it. But as we went through, it was a confidence level builder as we went through, too, so that we had confidence in it. And I remember one of the first meetings we ever had with Bob Gilruth, who ran the program at that time. I think the first meeting he ever had with us, he said that if at any point any of us decided that this wasn't for us, we had enough doubts about the program, we could go back to our services where we had come from and, and no questions asked, and that was it. All we had to do was say the word. And, uh, of course, nobody ever did. We were fighting to get positions, not to go back someplace. And so when you get on top of this, there's a, there's a, uh, and when people ask what's it feel like, we had sort of a standard answer after some of those early flights. What's it feel like when you're getting ready to go? It's how do you think you'd feel if you knew you're on top of two million parts built by the lowest bidder on a government contract? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but our confidence level, that was a joke, obviously, but our, our confidence level was good or we wouldn't have gone. We weren't out to, uh, we weren't out to commit suicide, but uh, we thought what we were doing was important for the country. And we're so? proud to be there and, and proud to be participating in it and, uh, and wanted to get on with it. We had tried to foresee everything could possibly happen. We imagined everything that might occur, you know. Uh, micrometeorites, you, know, you name it. We had tried to think of it and tried to take us, make some plan of how you would deal with that. Well, I came around at the end of the first orbit, just as the sunrise, and I was uh, doing something, glanced out the window just at the uh, first sunrise. Window was up over my head like this. I glanced out the window, and it was very startling because as far as I could see, there were literally, looked like millions of just little specks and they were sort of a glowing yellow color. Now we hadn't, there, you know, at least on those early flights, we didn't dump any urine overboard or anything like that, and so, uh, but, so that would have caused any yellow particles or anything. But this was startling. There was nothing was, uh, that I had done, and here yet, as far as I could see, were just millions of these particles. They had the color of uh, like a firefly out in the meadow on a summer evening. If you took a firefly and turned it on and just kept that little thing on, don't let it blink on and off, 
That's what these look like, millions of them out here as far as I could see. And that was quite startling. And uh, the, the whole thing was moving very slowly, the whole cloud of them moving very slowly as though I was moving through them at maybe three or four or five miles per hour, very slowly. Like after the flight, I remember George Ruff, who was the psychiatrist that uh, followed us around in those early days. And uh, George used to cock his head to one side like this and ask questions sometimes. And he was from the University of Pennsylvania. And I was doing a debriefing and George sat in the back of the room and I was describing these very seriously and, and talking about them. And George cocked his head and said, and what did they say, John? <laughs> <laughs> Never forgot that. <laughs> I don't think any of us foresaw the attention that was going to come on the program. Right off the bat, we start getting letters from school kids and all sorts of things. And it's like we were in on the beginning of it. It'd be almost like you were starting a brand new Navy or Air Force or Marine Corps or Army. And there you were, and you're starting to form a whole new service all at once. This was a whole new, whole new area. And it was looked at so carefully and uh, yet was on sort of a tenuous uh, support for funding. People didn't quite know where we're going. It was, uh, and I was afraid at that time that if uh, there was any very severe publicity about the group, negative publicity, that it could affect the kind of, of, uh, of support funding out of the Congress. It could, uh, it could really harm us somewhat. So I was a little bit concerned about it. Uh, I didn't have one of the Corvettes down there. I had to drive back and I, I le had left my family in Arlington and drove back and forth uh, to down there over weekends, and we traveled a lot. And uh, so I hadn't moved my family down there, and and we didn't have a lot of money then. So uh, I had a little, a small car that a very economical two-cylinder car that I drove back and forth uh, on weekends when I go down there, mainly to save money. And uh, so. That was my transportation. But looking back on it, I think there were a lot of things that sort of tied in together at that time. We were at sort of a low point. We had had Sputnik, and we had had, and we were sort of coming back, and there was sort of a low psyche or morale in the country. And, and uh, this wasn't, never in modern history had the technological superiority of the United States ever been questioned. We were the leaders. We were the world's leaders in science and technology. Nobody questioned that. Coming out of World War II and, and uh, up to these days, and all at once, the Russians, all these, you know, a lot of people looked at any Bolsheviks, whatever. They were over there, you know, and here we were. All at once, they had exceeded us, something we had tried to do and failed. And they, all at once, they had done it. And we couldn't minimize that. And so that was sort of a blow, I think, to the American psyche a little bit. So we were sort of low, and I think. Uh, my flight came at the right time to sort of help bring us out of that, and I think that's one reason it got so much attention and so much uh, so much uh, excitement after the flight. But were we surprised about all that kind of attention? Yes, the Cape and and the back up here and Washington and uh, ticker tape parade in New York, which uh, which somebody told me not too long ago. But the, you know they measure these ticker tape parades by how many thousand tons of debris they pick up and take to the dump someplace. And someone told me that the, that the ticker tape parade I had in New York will never be exceeded. I think it was 3,700 tons or something like that of stuff they took out. Will never be exceeded. And I said, oh, come on, I, records are made to be broken. No, there's a reason for this. The new buildings in New York, you can't open the windows. They're air conditioned, and we don't have all the ticker tape and the paper anymore. We're all computerized. And so now when there's a ticker tape parade in New York, the maintenance people take a few barrels of paper up and chunk them over the side off the roof. So maybe it is a record that'll last a while. I don't know. A record not to be broken. <laughs> See, I was the oldest of the first group of astronauts. And uh, he said at that time that the upcoming lunar flights, which were planned to be within a 10-year period, that by the time they came up, I was probably going to be beyond 50 years of age. And for me to stick around being the world's oldest permanent training used secondhand astronaut, whatever, uh, he didn't put it in those words, those are my words, but uh, he thought that I should win some areas of training and management. That's what he wanted me to do, and I, d I didn't want to really do that. I didn't want to stay if I wasn't going to be able to, uh, to uh, be on a regular flight status.